Once again, Halloween is around the corner, so I thought it'd be fun to start the month off with a smaller game. No One Lives Under the Lighthouse puts you in the exciting job of being a lighthouse keeper. You have your chores like keeping the light filled, property maintenance, and advanced property maintenance. If you explore around, each run will be about two to three hours each, but it does have multiple endings and some other reasons to replay it. Just a few weeks before this video, the game got a director's cut. Some graphics were improved, a few overly cryptic objects were made less cryptic, there's a level selector for replays, and the entire second half of the game has been remade. That's a bold choice. So if you've played before, there's a lot that's new, and mostly for the better. Okay, let's see the intro. From here you have your duties listed out to you. If the intro wasn't clear enough, this is going to be a very slow burn kind of horror. At this point I kind of have to address the other lighthouse in the room. If you haven't seen it, it's a great movie, and you can see where they could have taken inspirations here and there. There are themes of isolation and madness, twisted visions of ocean mythos. There are common elements, but it's way, way too far removed to be called any kind of ripoff. But it keeps that same oppressive atmosphere with one hell of a payoff. Your keeper is also going to be completely alone for the foreseeable future. There won't be more supplies for another week, so it should be easy going until then. Right? Let's start with the visuals. This is one of those haunted PlayStation 1 styles of games. I'm not sure how accurate that genre term is, or if it even is a genre, but it conveys the idea instantly and that's what matters. You even have an option to add pixel dithering, in case you do want to go that extra step of authenticity. I don't trust YouTube not to compress the hell out of some scenes, so I didn't use it for the video. If hard pixels make your eyes dance too much, there's a smoothing option. It'll never take jagged edges completely away, but that's part of the style. And it is a Ukrainian developer and things never go smooth over there. You can't press a smooth button on life. While the director's cut updated a few things, the overall style hasn't changed. I've played games like this where the style seemed to be the only thing going for it, but here it's used very effectively. You can easily recognize large landmarks, but some things are distorted just out of sight. When you see horrible things later, it's just obscured enough that your mind can fill in some blanks. Your keeper house may be small, but due to that effect, it feels safe. From here, at least you can tell what everything is. As you explore the island, you're not sure what could be up ahead. Everything is fogged and fuzzy, except for the lighthouse itself. It just looms over everything, and something is sinister about it. But every night, you've got to go back to it. They don't make the build up too slow either. They're quick to establish the threat you're dealing with and that you might have to hop into action mode any second. So having everything partially obscured with this constant visual reminder of you have to go back in the tower is a great move. Every day brings new challenges and sometimes you don't know what the hell you're looking at. They especially ramp this up later, but I won't be spoiling any of that yet. Still, a repetitive job with new daily horrors does remind me of my time in retail. Even after all that happens here, I'm still not sure which job I'd rather do. I never opened a tile box full of spiders working the lighthouse. Anyway, the game has a lot of visual atmosphere, and the sound and music go a long way in helping to build the dread. The music is mainly a droning ambient sound, but there are plenty of times when it's silent and it's just you in the environment. Until it creeps back in. Actually, I don't know if that was the music at all. It could have been something else. It's not clear what could be a musical sting or something in the environment. This is a subtle and really clever way to fuck with you. The sound design is cleaned and mixed well and the music blends right into that.
A sound could be a foghorn from a passing ship, the music, or the terror from the deep. The key is that it keeps you guessing. Even the comforts you have like the record player have something off about them, and whatever is wrong is only going to get worse. What I like is how mundane everything seems at first, but there are a lot of red flags if you pay close attention. Something horrific is clearly bubbling under the surface, but you have to do your job. What is the black sludge that keeps appearing? I don't know, but you better clean it off the tower. That's your job. If something tries to break through your roof and murder you, you've got to go fix that hole. That's where you live. You're not only trapped in the situation, but trying to live normally through it. Isolated out there, it's really all you can do. This does mean your main form of gameplay is walking around and interacting with tools. There are some light, puzzle, problem-solving elements to that, but nothing too in-depth. There are times when you'll need to run away and hide. There are some combat moments in the game which are stiff, but it's only a moment per playthrough. The clunkiness does add tension to the situation, but it's not enough in the game to really go in-depth on. I wouldn't call it a walking sim kind of game, just be aware it's not too far away from those. This is easily one of the most true-to-Lovecraft games I've played, and there are no tentacle monsters or wild screen effects because you're going crazy. Instead, those only show up when you get drunk. I appreciate when games don't just use a blurry screen to convey madness. Even then, it's not clear if that's what's happening. Similar to Paratopic, time will skip around. Your perspective might have changed, or maybe it hasn't. In your first playthrough, you can only endure it and get back to work. If it's not clear already, I do recommend this game. At 7 bucks on Steam, it's basically on permanent sale, though it is marked down even more for October. I try not to cut things this short, but if you want to go in as blind as possible, now's when you get off. I'm also going to be talking about the old version of the game. You can always play the game and come back, but if you don't want spoilers, go to here. Okay, someone lives under the lighthouse, but you'll know that by day two. Sometimes, something emerges from beneath the surface to murder you. Most people will die during this, thinking it's a cutscene, but you actually still control your character during it. This is a cool way of letting you be attacked and chased by the monster, but you're still not seeing it. At this rate, I was expecting an arachnid warrior bug. It was a lot scarier than that, at least in this version. In the original, things are simpler, but don't linger with you as much. In both versions, you might see the silhouette of a figure beneath the lighthouse. If you do try to pursue it, it just vanishes. Eventually, the old design of the creature pursues you beneath the lighthouse. You stumble into a maze and find the remains of an ancient civilization. Except this seems to be a flashback and you're playing the Old Keeper. The game has had a running theme of moths being around, so of course they're also the ancient civilization. To make things easier, I'm going to call these guys the Flan, since in real life some lighthouse keepers did go missing near the Flan and Isles, though that was likely due to a storm and not bug people. The Flan temple in this version isn't too otherworldly. The most unsettling thing I found was the statue. And that's because it reminded me of the bugs from Starforge, and I don't want to fucking think about that. Anyway, their greatest treasure is, what else? A big light. It shifts between the old keeper escaping with the light and the new one being transformed. When the new one awakens, he's compelled by forces he doesn't understand because he's been transformed into a giant larva. You now play as the monster. You crawl around leaving sludge trails, you eat burlap. Some behaviors of the creature are starting to make sense now. After molting, it looks like you chase and attack yourself from earlier. This reminded me of a webcomic I saw years ago, which I cannot remember the name of. Basically, a guy sees his cat get stolen by an eldritch creature and chases it out to try and find it. He endures horrible tortures, but does escape back into the real world. He finds his pet, but realizes that he's the monster he saw. Because time works differently in Yash Blavial, so sort of a twist on the outsider. The director's cut especially seems like this could be happening, but instead it's more cyclical. The Flan Explorer is the original Keeper. He brings new ones to the lighthouse where they're consumed and reborn. Things being moved around was the work of the monster having faint memories of humanity. If the monster kills the Keeper instead of sacrificing them for transformation, or the Keeper kills the monster, then the lighthouse collapses and the cycle is broken. The lighthouse was bait for a process we can never fully understand. Having played through this, I can see why they made some changes. While it does have some cool alien visuals, the whole it's a moth thing is way too on the nose. I can appreciate it being like a moth and drawn to the light, but they made it way too silly. The temple has a giant blocky moth on it, and worst of all, the monster itself is a big mothman. And not the kind that hangs out before a bridge collapse. The design could work in a higher fidelity game, but here it is way too funny looking. I want the light turned on. Going back to completely change that design was a wise idea. It's still inspired by a moth, but definitely not one. Compared to the old version, the director's cut is a much more intense game. You no longer one-shot the monster in a lit space. No longer are the ruins of the Flan something too familiar. Whatever they were and whatever the hell they were doing actually seems beyond our thought now. Their world is bizarre, but there is some kind of logic behind it. 
It's like nothing you've experienced all game, and this adds extra tension. You've gotten familiar with the surface world and its places to hide, but here, you're in the monster's lair, and it's after you. It's a great shift, and light years ahead of the old level. The flashbacks are also much more elaborate, and there's a more personal story being told. The idea of the cycle remains intact, but now it's not clear what could be literal. And it looks like there could be some holdovers from the old story. For example, the larva eating stuff up for it to cocoon made sense before. You bulk up to make sick gains, we all read the book. Except now, instead of a life cycle, the Keeper now appears to be fully transformed into the monster. It could still like eating burlap, or maybe it's just trying to fuck with the Keeper, but compared to before, it just doesn't click as much. At the same time, it added a real fight against the Keeper. You try to ambush him in darkness and figure out where he's aiming by the glint of his gun, which is a fun and engaging sequence even if they had to power down the monster for it. Whether you kill or become the beast, both endings eventually lead to this temple. Parts of the Major Arcana will be lit up telling you which achievements you completed. You'll need to accomplish the ones here to achieve a third ending in the game. The Heart of Darkness informs you you're trapped in a dream. Deja vu. Until you accomplish all the tasks and recall what truly happened, you'll be trapped in your cycles of guilt. Oh, no. Why does this keep happening? Why does it always come back to I? It's now explained there was once a village on the island. The Keeper's son was killed, and it's not clear how it happened. Playing as the monster, there are now some nods to Joseph and his Gucci jacket, which got him in all sorts of trouble with his brothers. It's implied the village may have killed his son, possibly sacrificing him to the flan beneath or something like that. It's possible the father killed his son, or the son died due to his negligence. The creature could be real, or it could represent his guilt chasing him. Don't lose your mind is said both by the first lighthouse fairy and by a villager. It could be a monster killed his son and the father blamed the village and murdered all of them. The final epilogue ending does reveal that the father lives under the lighthouse, and finally coping with whatever happened, he buries his son. The lighthouse itself is decrepit and appears to have been abandoned for years. I understand the broad ideas and some possibilities, but a lot remains cryptic. Some of the arcana are tied into tasks you do in getting your life together, like cleaning your place up for one, though again, things are muddled. Before it was more literal, but clear what was happening. Now this story could be about a lighthouse hobo who lures people there to be murdered by him, among a dozen more possibilities. I guess it's hard to tell what's intentionally ambiguous and what's a holdover from the old story not making sense. I think it might be the latter because two of the ending cutscenes are being updated. If you're watching this video, that already happened. These remove a lot of unnecessary confusion, but does leave some good ambiguity. No one who plays the game blind from this point forward might ever know that all this happened. It's interesting on a meta level because things get cut all the time in games. Things get reworked internally all the time, and sometimes only a thread or two of the original idea remains. If I didn't know that you used to play as a larva, the whole eating a bag aspect might have never stuck out to me. Drastically remaking half your game that was publicly out does open you up to those kinds of thoughts. But after playing both, I think that decision was greatly for the better. This is a small, great slow build-up horror game. It gives you a lot of reasons to explore and replay it. Even in such a low-budget title made by a three-person studio, they understand the genre better than some games that had tens of millions behind them. It's easy to point out where things are stiff, or where animations and voice acting could have improved things, but they worked in their limits phenomenally. This is an easy recommend for me, especially for a Halloween game. If you like horror movies that people call boring, you'll probably love this. At its price, it's worth a shot. That's it for now. Next time, things get even scarier. While playing this, I had someone message, that's my face in the mirror, which scared the hell out of me, of course. It turned out the face model for the Keeper found out I was doing a video. So at least that made sense. The next game will stay a surprise. No one's guessed it yet, so I'll see you then. What are my thoughts on PT? I mean, nothing crazy here. It was great, and I wish we got the whole thing. I did like Layers of Fear, which is a pretty blatant PT clone. I wanted to do a video on that and also Observer, but that company has a strange relationship with trademarking. They were clearly borrowing a lot of ideas, but the second they got one, they instantly patented it. So, we'll see. The coyotes will respect me more if I pronounce it as coyotes. Okay, so is that a Midwestern thing or like a scattered regional dialect kind of thing? I've never figured out where the difference is. Summer or winter? The humidity murders us down here, so easily winter. Plus, fall and winter have all the good holidays. I guess my real answer would be fall. Is Lovecraftian horror going through a renaissance period? Or is it so overexposed that people are being desensitized to it? It seems like the official based on Lovecraft properties have been pretty awful. God help you if you watched all of Lovecraft Country. But when it comes to stuff influenced by Lovecraft, but not with like his name stamped on it, it's actually been pretty good. Just across media in general, not just video games. I still need to play The Sinking City properly, which is currently caught in a legal battle between the publisher and the studio, so there's no telling when that'll be rightfully available. The one on Steam is an older, more broken version. The one on their website is real, but the client sucks. Hopefully that'll be squared away. I am about to do and not I love that again. No faith video yet. Trilogy's not done.